Well, welcome and thank you to, for uh, coming. I'm uh, Daniel Mack. I'm the Associate Dean of Libraries for Collection Strategies and Services. And uh, thank, you to, thank you all for coming to our uh, fall lecture in our uh, Future of the Research Library speaker series. Um, this might be the last talk that we have in the series under the current name. We've been talking about renaming the series. Uh, we were talking about it at breakfast with our speaker today. Maybe something about uh, the library being a leader. You know, we'd like to hear all of your thoughts on this topic. But right now, I would like to introduce our speaker, David Lankus. David is a professor and the director of the University of South Carolina's School of Library and Information Science. David has always been interested in combining theory and practice to create active research projects that make a difference. His work has been funded by organizations such as the MacArthur Foundation, the Institute for Library and Museum Services, NASA, the U.S. Department of Education, the U.S. Department of Defense, the National Science Foundation, the U.S. State Department, and the, library, the American Library Association. David is a passionate advocate for libraries and their essential role in today's society, earning him the American Library Association's uh, Ken Haycock Award for promoting librarianship in 2016. He also seeks to understand how information approaches and technologies can be used to transform industries. In this capacity, David has served on advisory boards and study teams in the fields of libraries, telecommunications, education, and transportation, include, uh, including at the National Academies. He's been a visiting fellow at the National Library of Canada, the Harvard School of Education, and was the first fellow of ALA's Office for Information Technology Policy. His book, The Atlas of New Librarianship, one of my favorites, won the 2012 ABC Clio Greenwood Award for the best book in library literature. So please join me in welcoming David Lankins. Thank you very much. It's great seeing you, um, particularly because we thought it was 10 o'clock and it was an empty room and I was taking it personally. But uh, I really, no, I really appreciate you coming out. Um, so I want to talk about data, media, and society. And at any point, um, feel free to interrupt me if you have figured out the future and I would appreciate knowing it. Uh, when putting these presentations together, I was approached over the summer to come. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. Um, but it's one of those, we need a title and we need an abstract. And so you put together a title and an abstract and you hope that it will be relevant in some ways. Um, and, and it turns out, fortunate for me, that last week the uh, Atlantic um, published, hopefully, just a moment please. There you go. Published this article on um, college students just want normal libraries. Um, I don't know if you've read it, um, but I can save you time. It's, it's, it's a work. It's, a, it's definitely interesting, um, particularly in how they define what a normal library is. Uh, normal library is a quiet place to study, uh, collaborate on group projects, the ability to print research papers, and access to books. Notably, many students say they like relying on librarians to help them track down hard-to-find text or navigate scholarly journal databases, which is a pretty classical definition. I didn't put the abnormal stuff in here, but um, because I think you've done them all. Uh, there's, you, they want maker spaces, and they want entrepreneurial startups, and good lord, all these crazy things because as we were saying in breakfast, clearly we're searching for our purpose, but you know, not trying new things to solve problems. Now, why I dislike this article in so many, many ways um, is because they even, it, it's very, contradictory even within the text uh, about what students want and how they evaluate it. For example, um, in saying they want normal libraries and then they spend a lot of time talking about people want books and they're willing to drive for books because electronics, you know, screens, people can't learn off of them well. I mean, it's just it's a wandering through the, the maze of, well, frankly, bad ideas. Um, and they even reference this uh, text the book of uh, the books of college libraries are turning into wallpaper. So talking about how students desperately want physical books, 
while citing articles that talk about a 64% decline in circulation at Yale, a uh, 75% decline at the University of Virginia. Um, this idea that somehow everyone wants physical books, that's why they're in this library. And the answer is, well, are they? Even your own data is not showing that necessarily. But to me, the cardinal sin of this article and where I'd like to start today is actually the fact that they're building this argument, the author is building the argument that they want normal stuff by reviewing different studies, reviewing different pieces of feedback, and those feedbacks come from everyone from Duke to the Northern Virginia Community College, to Claremont College, which is the 6,300 uh, full-time students, to McAllister, which is 2,000 students in the liberal arts, and saying the future is, or this is what they want. The idea that somehow there is one type of academic library that has one type of student in it that has one set of desires. And pulling all these different bits of data and these different, really, anecdotes to, to prove the point. So what I wanted to talk about is normally when I think about the future or when I'm asked to, to comment on the future, um, I use something to, to this effect, which is, this is actually just talking to a set of our doctoral students um, this past week about setting up research agendas. How do you set up an agenda? And the idea is, well, you pick something you want to look at, whether it's academic research libraries or what have you, and you describe the phenomenon. And then what you know is that at some point, there's going to be some predicted future. That if nothing changes or if we keep heading this direction, this is going to happen, right? And we're used to this because it's always in the library land, and particularly the academic library land, it's always about our demise, which is lovely, um, counter to every bit of data we can now pull. And so the predicted future is if nothing changes, we'll become obsolete, irrelevant, et cetera. Um, and a lot of science and a lot of, of academics stop there. We think that that's the purpose of research, to predict the future, to get, come with some predictive power, to come with theories, to come with models, to come with some way of matching the data and therefore anticipate what's coming on. And it shows up in lots of different ways. For example, once again, when I'm working with doctoral students, I can't publish this because it doesn't have data. It's got to be an empirical piece. When, in fact, a lot of what you talk about is some of the most instrumental and revelatory articles we have in our field had an N of six or an N of zero in some cases, right? The concept of relevance and information retrieval was developed by, frankly, someone sitting and having a really great idea and publishing one article. They got him tenure. One article for tenure is pretty damn impressive. Um, I'm a big fan, um, for those of you, back in, in my reference days, I'm a big fan of, of Bob Taylor's work. And um, one of the, I think, the seminal articles in reference is Taylor 68, where he talked about question negotiation. And he talked about how the phases that people go when they phrase a question, from an unstated need to a stated need to a compromised need. To, you know, and it's amazing. In fact, I have colleagues at different library schools around the country that name like pets after them. You know, that someone had, I think is, it's um, Dr. Fisher had a cat named Taylor 68. And when you dig into it, it was basically Bob Taylor as the director of a library sitting down with six of his reference librarians going, so how does this work? And so that idea of predictive power and understanding, but this is a lot of how we think about science. And so what I begin to do is say, when you want to think about the future, when you want to think about the agenda, one thing that we often don't do is we need to set up what our ideal future is. What do we want it to be? And so at breakfast, we were talking about the title of the speaker series of you know what is the future of, of research libraries, the question I think misses something because it assumes that there is a future, it assumes that there's one future, and it assumes that we're headed towards it, as opposed to getting a sense of agency. What do we want that future to be? How should we shape things, right? And between your ideal future and the predicted future, there'll always be some gap, maybe monumental, maybe itty bitty, but that's sort of part of what we're talking about with Science is not simply predicting the future, but really trying to push us toward an ideal future. And then if you're putting together an agenda, what you begin to do is talk about what are the different steps to end up at that gap. What I want to talk to you in part about today is the fact that this model is lovely for a doctoral student or a scholar coming up with a research agenda, but it's really horrible for a sector because what we are in a situation is there are lots and lots and lots of potential ideal futures. What the ideal future is for the University of Maryland libraries and the University of South Carolina libraries and the Duke libraries and such don't have to be the same. 
right? When we begin to talk about our common futures, we have to begin to understand that there's some major things occurring right now in the field. First of all, libraries are changing quickly. I don't spend a lot of time putting different walls up of this is an academic library, this is a public, and this is a school, because we're all sort of on the same mission. And we can learn from all different types of libraries and what they're serving. And we know that libraries are changing quickly. We know that uh, they are because they're in response to the environment that we're in. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about, for example, the big push for data and data decision and data-driven decision in higher education. So we're changing that way. We're changing because of students, right? The student populations, they're getting younger, they're getting, I'm sorry, they're actually getting older and more diverse at the undergraduate level. At the graduate level, they're getting younger. Um, for example, when, uh, about 12 years ago at Syracuse, when we looked at the average age of people coming to library science programs, it was in the mid-30s and coming near 40. Today, that number is now at the lower end of 30 and going into the 20s because more and more people are coming directly from their undergraduate degree into library and information science. Right? That changes things. It changes things from I've never had to deal with until the past few years calling a student's parent to tell them not to call up their internship site supervisor and tell them they're being mean, right? We never, <laughs> we never sort of thought about the idea that library science doing interns still have helicopter parents hanging around. That's a new thing for us, right? And so we have to change to that. We have to change that online education is changing how we do things at all levels, the undergraduate and graduate. That, as we'll talk about a little bit uh, further, for profit has changed how we look at students and engaging students. So we're dealing with a very diverse set of things. And libraries are changing in response to that, as they should. The conceptualization of libraries are also rapidly changing, in fact, not even keeping pace with the changes. Right? So if you look over, you know, take the last 10 years, libraries have gone from gateways to hubs to community centers to whatever it is. We're looking for a new way of, of talking about them. My current favorite is talking about the library as a movement. Um, and that was with um, the folks at the Aarhurst Library developing how they interact with their community. And what they're doing is they really are defining the library as a movement that has librarians, but also standing side by side with engineers and citizens and mothers and such, and they're all trying to have positive social action. Right? Well, that's great, but it's hard to express and move around. And we also know that our conceptualizations within the field are actually changing much more rapidly than those outside of the field. And so we have to deal with the deadly nostalgia problem. John Palfrey in his book, um, Bibliotech, um, really talked about how nostalgia is a major issue. And it's true. Right? So I always say in, in public libraries, the problem is that people's idea of a library was created 30 years ago when they were 10 years old. And the problem isn't just that it was 30 years ago. It was through the eyes of a 10-year-old at the time. And it hasn't matured much since then. In school libraries, the average age of board members is in the 60s. And so what you're dealing with is people, as they're thinking about education and pushing education and moving education, they haven't been in these things for a long time. Right? We're dealing with all of these sorts of things where faculty have not engaged libraries recently, administrators have not engaged recently. And we have these really different situations. We also have a different situation in that we're getting undergraduates coming to our universities where their concepts were properly formed around a really proactive, supportive library environment if they had a really good school librarian in high school. And the phenomenon that I'm watching with great awe is how many undergraduates at our university are still great users of their high school libraries. That when they go to look for resources, when they go to get databases, when they go to materials, they go back to their online high school libraries because they have the databases and articles and systems that they were well taught to use. Bypassing our instruction, bypassing our different systems, that's where they felt comfortable, that's where it was formed, and so they become using in that environment. We also have a situation that in the higher education standpoint, right, we have a situation that we're having a hard time clarifying what a library is sometimes because we're developing it. And to us, it's a fluid concept. Fluid concepts don't work really well when you're doing forecasting and planning and budgeting. Right? Um, one of my current real interests is the notion of library anxiety. Um, people are publishing on that. When people come into the building, we can, with our physical spaces, either produce or relieve anxiety. And that concept of this being a place for people to come and study, 
that it's that third space on the university campus, right? I, I'm either in the classroom, I'm being terrified by my roommate, or I can go to the library and ignore the world, right? That's an interesting thing to do. And we're seeing gate counts go up, and we're seeing great new uses of this facility, but not necessarily the services. But that's also diverse based on different libraries and different situations. What you may be encountering in Maryland, I know is different than what they're happening at the Virginia um, community colleges. So we're having, we're changing quickly. We're trying to get a grasp on what it is. But part of the reason that we're having such a trouble getting a grasp on how to conceptualize a library is not only are libraries changing rapidly, but they're changing diversely. I don't know if that's grammatical, but stick with me for a moment. Um, and that is, we really, I, I see internationally that libraries are really getting this idea that you shape yourself around a community, not your community around you. At least verbally we're saying that, right? The, the days I remember talking many years ago to an academic uh, law librarian, and she goes, our job is to teach them how to use a law library, because all law libraries are in essence the same. And I said, that's interesting. And then you would talk to lawyers, and they're like, no, that's our private law firm is this way, the, your school is this way, et cetera. And so training them, you're training them to use you. And so what we've now said is that's bad. What we really want to do is conform and build services around community needs. So we do community assessments, we do surveys, we get all this kind of data. And what we're finding is a, the, the community that is the University of Maryland is different than the University of South Carolina. And it may not be massively different, but it's different. Right? And we know that that's going to be different from a community college. And we know that a public library in Seattle is going to be different than a public library in Syracuse, New York, and a public library in Tallahassee, Florida. And so they're changing. So how we conceptualize that in our local setting can be very different even if we're both academic libraries. And so we run into this situation where, once again, we're changing, we're changing community needs, and we're changing so that we're not the same. Walking into an academic library here and walking into another academic library isn't necessarily how it used to be, which was, I can expect the following things. And that means, as a library science educator, we have problems. We have to spend a lot of time in how we prepare people and thinking about how we, what is, what is foundational? What is the core services, right? The current one that we're talking about, I'll bring it up again in a moment, which is in reference and instruction, right? It went from reference and instruction to instruction and reference. How do we teach that? And we even know that that reference component itself, we're now really conceptualizing a reference transaction, not as a transaction, but as a learning experience, where people are coming with a diverse set of understandings and part of it's normalizing, finding language use, finding materials, how they fit it in. It's a very different relationship that we're having. So, but that's all right. We've solved this problem because I don't need to worry about all that because I'm at the future of research libraries, so that makes it much more clear. So, let's talk a little bit about what I see as elements of the future of a research library. And what I'm going to do is, is just start with the macro trends of the field. Right? So here are three things that when I look across research libraries, and really, let's be honest, when I look across ARL-esque univ research university libraries, right? I, I'm not talking about research libraries that are embedded in research centers and in private industry and such. So we're talking academic libraries. So, one of the first macro trends is this notion of community, the idea of creating open meeting spaces, becoming publishers of the community. Um, academic commons is a big idea. The focus on undergraduates and place, right? That sort of fits in this community trend. And, uh, you know, once again, I stole your website. Um, I took a train here yesterday, so I have plenty of time to cut and paste. Uh, and so, you know, that's what we've got, right? You come to the library not only to get your books and materials, but you can interact with the Learning Center and the Writing Center. You can interact with these types of services, and they're all there. The other major trend that's going on is, the, is a push towards open resources. The biggest of that is open access, pushing for open access, different budget models, thinking about how that con that's constructed, and thinking about how we con faculty into going this way when, by God, they've had it right for 2,000 years. Why would they change now? Um, and so open access, repository, open educational resources, digitizing and orphan works, right? This is the idea that we really are looking at collections besides things that we can acquire, besides things that we can license, and things that we can create and make available. 
And what's interesting, of course, is it gets right into the economics and the budget model where you may not have been in the way. Right? We now have radically different pressures on us, which is no longer how does our budget meet the need. It's now turned into how does the budget meet the transformational need of the whole institution. Right? It's one thing to say, can I afford these journals for engineering? It's another thing to say, I can't afford journals ever. We need to change the whole journal process. But that's the scale of what we're discussing. And data, which is where I'm going to go in a moment, but that's not data repositories, how we do research data services, creating data management plans, doing analysis. Some universities are doing visualization services, a whole suite of sort of data hygiene issues. And so these are some macro trends that I want to talk about because oftentimes they are seen as independent. There's one thing that obviously draws them all together, and I just need to mention it, which is instruction runs across this, whether we're doing bibliographic instruction and how people I still hate bibliographic instruction as a phrase, but anyway, how we're teaching people to do citations and how we're doing information literacy courses and how we're do, going into classes and teaching graduate students, undergraduate students, and oftentimes faculty how to use different resources. But in terms of open resources, it's about providing instruction and being instructors ourselves and in data, a lot of information on teaching faculty about data and data systems and data processes. Two years ago, I was on the IMLS review panel for their, for their Laura Bush grant and I think I received, my review lot was about 10, and nine of them were about academic libraries, something to do with data and data science, whether it was creating repositories, most of them were about creating training and educational systems. So big area. But I want to talk about how they're actually, while we've been approaching them separately, they're not. But I'm going to start for, with a moment with data. So. We have a problem. This is not, by the way, going to be a qualitative rant. I am a qualitative researcher, but this is not the, oh, poor us, everything is all about, you know, people's feelings and interactions and how they value things, and you can, can't get that through a survey or a number. This isn't that question. What it is, is it's talking about we have a serious issue in higher education with data. And that is, we love it, we want it, we ignore it, and it's crap. Little problems. Just little problems. Right? We know that universities are increasingly relying on data to make decisions, or as we were talking about at breakfast, looking for data to illustrate the decisions they've already made. Um, <laughs> my favorite line with that, which is, I find people who want statistics don't tend to care which ones I give them. Um, and so, but what I've seen in university after university after university, and I'll show you very particular, my university, I'm willing to show warts and all, is that there are really some fundamental, I mean, this is, this is librarianship 101 as taught by Dewey stuff, which is things like lack of data definitions, right? So what is a student? What is a full-time student? What is a part-time student? We think we could agree, but we can't. And so what happens is people are entering data into the lovely data warehouse where they're just sort of making it up as they go. What is an interaction? What is an event? What is a transaction? We don't have common data definitions on many campuses, and yet we're increasingly relying on data to make decisions. Lack of data integrity. We have multiple scales, multiple methods of creating them. We have different data entry standards, different formats, when's expected, et cetera. We're just producing such bad data on such a massive scale, it's kind of frightening. And any sort of lack of data compliance, that is, is there any consequence for this, right? So when we put in our data and it's garbage, is there anyone knocking on the door of a unit, a department, et cetera, and saying, you've got to clean up your act, this is not working, right? And so why I'm bringing this up is I see a really huge role for research libraries in data, but it's not necessarily on the research part of the shop, it's on the business part of the shop. As we move, so my university, for example, is moving to, I, I forget the name of it du jour, but the value-centered model, responsibility-centered model. In essence, they give you this lovely formula of how many students and how much this and that equals how much money you have to spend. So supposedly distributing budget authority and decision making. I won't go too much farther into why I don't think that's true, but I can. Th you give me the rules, I'll figure out how to break them. It's all good. Um, 
So we have this push for this kind of data. We're seeing this, by the way, not just in terms of budgeting and budgeting decisions. We're seeing this in program assessments and developing programs. We're seeing increasing um, needs for compliance in, in our uh, accrediting bodies, both at the university, ALA, et cetera, that's pushing for different data in how we do this. And we're running into this problem on a pretty regular basis. So I want to give you a quick example. This is um, Academic Performance Solutions by, um, by, a, by what is it? EAB. And I'm going to let me see if I, hopefully, I, clicking will work here. Uh, just a moment, please. Please stick with me. All right. So, assuming that I'm, in fact, online and I can bring my web browser over here. There we go. He says, as it sits there and clicks. So this is data that comes out of the data warehouse for the University of South Carolina. I want to be that person. Thank you. And what it does is it tells you everything about how you're doing. right? And it goes into the data warehouse. And like I say, if it's a little slow, I will, I'll switch over to something else. And you can do things like, how many students did you have? How many students per instructor? How many students per instructor? And what was the cost of the instructor? What was the level? How many tenure track faculty were teaching uh, graduate classes, how many undergraduate, I mean, you would imagine what it is. And this is their sort of big takeaway, which is capacity planning. So department growth, departmental growth over here, right? And the idea is they, they're going to tell you which is your oversubscribed and which is your undersubscribed, right? So I'm in a college of information and communications. That's this college. We have a school of library and information science, about 300 graduate students, about 85 undergraduate students, about 10 doctoral students. I have a sister school in journalism and mass communications, about 1,200 undergraduates, about 20 graduate students, and maybe two doctoral students, right? We have great conversations. Um, here's the trick. This is the data that's being presented to my provost and such as making decisions. You see this big button over here next to the, let's see, if you roll over, this is the department. This is areas where you basically oversubscribed and can use resources. That is the School of Journalism and Mass Communications. You see this itty bitty little dot right over here next to the phrase possible resource reallocation? That's the School of Library and Information Science. I love this graph. Let me tell you a little bit about why we're an itty bitty button, an itty bitty line. It's not because we're lazy. Um, so 95% of our courses we teach online. It turns out that there's a lot of paperwork involved if you need to add students to a capped class, right? So if, you, if you've ever encountered this, you have a room for 20 in the physical facility. If you want to put that 21st student in, there's paperwork involved. In an online class, there's no physical reason not to have 21, 22. There's no fire marshal coming in. So for many, 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 way too many years, the way that my staff would do this so they didn't have to do the paperwork is they would set the course caps at, and I'm not making up this number, 300. 300, right? And so when you run analysis about what your utilization is, if I had 70 people in an online class, which is a lot, it's still not 300. And so I'm more than half under my capacity. That's the data. There are other forms of data that, that go into this, whether they count, what they don't. In other words, it's bad data. And it has direct consequences in how we do things and my resources, my budgets, et cetera. So we are dealing with the situation. By the way, we created that situation. But it's also on the research side. So this is academic analytics, for those of you who play along at home, which is not only do we track what you're doing in terms of teaching, but we track in terms of research. And internet's great technology that never works in public. There we go. I agree to whatever I just agreed to. So if we go to my department and my productivity radar, because it's always good to have a radar, and I'm going to look at the Department of Library and Information Science, which is me. Yay, and I'm going to compare myself to other information schools, 73 departments. And there's my productivity radar. You'll notice that that gray represents the means and the averages. 
So I'm not up in very high in the means and the averages. Why, you may ask? Well, one, we could do a better job, always do a better job. But if you then look at some of the underlying data, and here I'm going to skip back just so I can save some time, this is the data that it's built. Um, I don't expect you to have kept up with the CV of all my faculty, but you'll see lots of zeros from the number of articles they've done to the number of awards that they've given to the number of books they've published. It's not true. This is the old Scopus problem, right? Which journals are you following? Which online systems are you following? How out of date is it? They actually look, for, in terms of grants, for IMLS funding, of which we have right now three current grants, and right now, if you look at it, it will be zero. Bad data, right? And so when you talk about in terms of libraries, what's your data? What's your utilization? When we look at value. What's the impact that you're having on student performance? What data are they using to acquire it? So what I'm pushing for here is that there is a role for the research library, not simply in supporting the research data and data generated out of the research process, but institutional data and data forms. Normally what it is is there's like one data officer sitting alone somewhere on campus, very bored, or terrified, which is often more the case, because the provost has just declared, I want a dashboard, give me a dashboard. Everything's about a dashboard, and so they put a dashboard together. But the underlying data is not good. Uh, one example I also wanted to give in terms of teaching is you'll notice that all of our classes are offered as SLIS, S-L-I-S, so SLIS 700, 600, whatever. And you'll, if you go into the data, it also lists our L-I-B-R, our library courses. We don't have library courses because we're not the library, but that's all right. Someone looked at it and saw the word library in our name and said, I'm sure they're the same, and put them together, right? Bad data. So what we need to talk about as a research library is how do we get into the data integrity business, right? How do we do this with institutional data? And then we need to advocate for this. And so it's a role in which we take what we're learning and teaching researchers how to do good data. We need to teach the institution how to do that good data as well. In terms of broadening the institutional data, what's really interesting is looking at universities as they're moving to looking beyond what happens in the classroom. So, uh, one current estimate is 80% of what an undergraduate student learns as a ca campus happens outside of the classroom. It happens in informal ways, but it also happens in formal ways, in community giving programs, in workshops, in different speaker events, and all of this stuff that the university does that doesn't show up into a classroom, and yet the only sort of hard data we have on it is the transcript, and that's all done by what you're registered for, what courses you've got. And so looking at developing, excuse me, new forms of experiential learning transcripts. How can we build portfolios based on the whole activity that students have? And so the question becomes with internships, community service, exponential learning, workshops, how can we really begin looking at capturing that? And so once again, oh, well, that's the registrar's problem. Actually, it's the exact opposite of the registrar's problem, right? That's student life's problem. That's this person's problem. That's undergraduate problem. It's a university problem. And therefore, as a library, as being people who understand data, data integrity, data management, et cetera, it's something that we can really move towards. Not only does it help in us making our case, but it also helps in taking the expertise that we're trying to teach faculty in terms of taking care of their data and keeping, putting our house in order. Um, a lot of this is looking at, for example, badging. How do we do badging? Uh, in the educational world, it's called micro-credentialing. Micro how do we do micro-credentials? Same thing as badging. Just, I actually think it's a cooler title. And one of the things we're going to talk about in a minute, which is how can we use this in different ways. So something that the research library can get involved in is getting our data house in order and beginning to capture this larger experiential stuff. We also very much need to talk about being advocate, at dealing with advocacy. Things of third-party data and privacy. Privacy in our institutional values, our archives, and our yearbooks and in dealing with foreign students. I was mentioning before, um, I had the great privilege of hiring a wonderful faculty member from Iran. The same day we sent the offer was the day that Trump put the travel ban on. And in talking with our international relations to get him his green card, to get him whatever, we were, it turns out that members of the board of trustees had requested a list of every Iranian student on campus. And then we're gonna go to others. Now, we refused, but that's an interesting question. This is where our values, it's not simply teaching them how to do good data, it's also advocating for how we use this. We're dealing with the notion of monetization, right? We need the same advocacy for research and institutional data 
put towards extending to all university data and seeing the library as a data steward. How can we become not just a place to help faculties plop their data, come up with a data plan, but really how do we clean up the institutional data because this is core to what we do. Right? Now the monetization is interesting. So I, I gave two quick examples here. One is um, the Pearson hack. So increasingly our faculty through no controlled systems are going out and acquiring learning management systems. And they say, no, we use Blackboard or Canvas or whatever it is. But in fact, what's happened is that when they're doing textbook selection, those textbooks, particularly electronic textbooks, come with systems of evaluation, management, and data collection. And so Pearson was collecting data on what they're reading, how they're reading, how well it's going, et cetera. And then they got hacked. So all that data is out and available. Is anyone looking at these kinds of data gathering systems going into our classroom on an instrumental basis? The other is a lovely one. It was the idea of creating a coffee shop on a cafe, which sounds great. And the coffee cost students zero dollars. All they had to do was give them data. They had to give them access to the data on their card, in case their student ID card, and they were reselling the data. Right? I'm not sure that's what we want to do, but I, I don't know about you, but I've talked with my undergraduates on a regular basis, and I said, if I can, cut your tuition bill in half tomorrow. And all it takes is for me to sell your data that the university collects to whoever wants it. Would you be okay with that? And the answer was yes. Yeah, I said, but then you start with the list. Are you okay with them knowing where you, when and where you were eating? Yes. Are you okay with them knowing when you went to your dorm? Yes. Are you okay if they know who you went to your dorm with? Hmm? <laughs> Are you okay with us sharing your Wi-Fi records? Because every bit of website you've ever gone to in your dorm deep late at night is captured and is potentially transmitted. Are you okay with us sharing that data? Wait a minute, right? The idea is, right? There's a lot of sense that, for example, millennials, which I hate the idea that they're somehow mutant people that are separate from their other generation. That the kids these days, let's rephrase it the way that most of those articles should be phrased. The kids these days, get off my lawn, you know, they don't care about privacy and they're willing to give it out. But of course, that's not true. A lot of them are, realize exactly what they're giving out and they look at their privacy as currency. And it's a transactional cost. So they're actually making a rational decision, one that we may not agree with. But then the question is, is it a fully formed decision? And this is a role that we need to begin playing so that we can advocate for this. So talking about data as one of these macro trends, the idea being, all right, if you're in the data game, are you all in the data game? Or are you, once again, looking at an opportunity, low-hanging fruit, which is faculty that are gathering data, what we do with it? Important and powerful service. But exactly the core skills that we have in a research library are those that should be applied to institutional data in terms of not only clean, you know, data hygiene and management, but also our values and ethics and privacy. Are we at those gates? Are we talking about how we're sharing the data? Should we share the data? What's the privacy of the data, et cetera? I then want to talk a little bit about instruction and data moving, how they're not separate. So this is data now moving back into instruction. So this is uh, Bill Hogue. Bill Hogue is the retired CIO at the University of South Carolina, and I had the privilege of having him on my, my faculty for two years. And Bill Hogue did something which I don't think everyone agreed with, but it happened before my time, so I don't pretend, I just pretend it didn't, which is that he created a um, $70 million contract with IBM. And what they did is they more or less outsourced a huge percentage of what they were doing for IT support on campus. A lot of people who are working as university employees became contractors working for IBM. They looked at different scale programs. And this gets a lot of attention. Once again, good, bad, or indifferent, but a lot of people look at it. He came to me my first year and he said, the other part that no one talks about with that deal with IBM is not only did it bring their technology support, their enterprise group, it brought Watson, which is their AI division. And Watson, the IBM folks doing Watson, wanted to talk to the nursing program. So at South Carolina, the, I'm, once again, 95% of my class, those 300 students, are online. I'm the second largest online program on our campus. The first is nursing, at the graduate and undergraduate level. And IBM wanted to talk, and by the way, then the third is like way down here. But IBM wanted to talk to nursing, and, and I said, like, well, why? And they said, well, all right, skills-based curriculum, well-stated, clear outcomes, 
associated directly with lectures, readings, discussions, materials, a huge amount of structured data and unstructured data all around the skill system. They wanted to dump this into Watson and then have Watson watch and support students. That when a student was took an exam, I noticed you're struggling with this topic, here's an additional resource you may like. I noticed you're having trouble with the, with the readings, here's a video you might like. And the idea of creating adaptive learning systems. Now as he told me this, and I realized that library science was exactly the same in terms of these outcomes, I said, great, I'm out of a job, thanks for coming in. Right? It's the first time in all of this discussion around, right, we love this discussion about AI and automation because we sort of sit here with our degrees and say, well, they can't automate my job. And it was like the first time I sat there and said, oh my God, could they? And so what's interesting is this all fits under a larger rubric of um, adaptive, adaptive learning processes, right? So adaptive learning, if you haven't looked at it, it's a hot theme, go look at it. And it comes something to the effect of using data to enhance instruction. It's at K-12, it's, it's in uh, undergraduate, not so much in graduate. And I brought this report up in particular because it's published by Pearson. Because Pearson's looking, right, not for the good of the order. They're looking at a way of productizing this idea. That if I can bring all your undergraduates in, and I can in essence run them through self-driven modules, I can lower my instructional cost which, by the way, we've seen is something that we're monitoring on a direct basis. And we see that the resource for allocations come from low enrollment classes, not the big classes. You begin to say, uh-oh, what's going on here? And so this idea that somehow we can automate ourselves out of it using data as data is implemented to instruction is scary, quite frankly. The good news is it doesn't work, but it's still scary because we used to say that about everything. Right? Remember when we made fun of Surrey because she didn't understand, and now I drive around in a car where I talk to Alexa to turn things on and off for me. Right? It got better. AI has gotten better. It will continue to get better, and the question is, what's our role in it? So one of the things that we're developing now is a series of professional development modules for librarians without the library science degree. So how do I help librarians we're working right now with the Charleston Public Library, excuse me. Um, and Charleston Public Library has people that have been working there for 20 years, but they don't have their undergrad, they don't have their graduate degree. They may not even have an undergraduate degree. And so at 20 years in the pay schedule for the city, that means that they're sort of tapped. So what they're looking is, can we provide professional development through the university, not an academic degree, but something that has the university professional development certificate, because they can use that to do salary and pay adjustments which I think is fabulous. At the same time, they're looking at obviously making sure these folks have a sense of the value system, the skills and such to go with librarianship. But the model that we're looking at is not the traditional model of great, more continuing education. Because my library friends in here, you will attest to the fact that pick your area of the day, whether it's um, electronic collections and material acquisitions, user services, whatever you want, you could start up Monday morning with a big pot of coffee at 9 a.m. and at 9 p.m. on Friday, go to sleep without having slept, used the bathroom, eaten, anything else, and still not be done watching the webinars, the conference proceedings, the YouTube videos in your area. There's enough continuing education in our field. There's too much continuing education in our field. What's not in our field is coordination of that. How does it fit? How does it make sense? So one thing that we're seeing on a regular basis is when academic librarians, we send them off to conferences, right? I'm sure you guys do a brilliant job, but I've known a few people who go to the American Library Association conference and they do it one of two ways. One, they look at all their buddies and friends and so they make sure they go to those events. They look to make sure that the authors that they want to talk to or get signatures isn't against it, so they go to that event. Um, and then maybe they go to something they're really interested in. Or the second one, which is my favorite, um, you go in, you go to the exhibit floor, you find three people you know, as you see them go, oh my God, I'm so busy. And after the third person, you leave the door and you go enjoy the city, right? <laughs> so one of those two ways. But there isn't a coordination. And so the goal here with this instruction was, if we have a student, a student, we define competencies, right? So these people coming in, we say technology, management, cultural competencies, not things that would shock you. And we develop sort of, this is what that rubric looks like. This is what the outcome is. And then we have those students take a test. The test comes back and says, strong, weak, you're ready to go, et cetera. And based on that test, 
suggest here are a bunch of online resources already existing. Here's a great one on generation code, and here's a great one on reference services or collection development. Go use them, and after you study, come back, take another test. If it says you're ready, then we have a human being who sits there, reviews the portfolio, and certifies what you're doing. Right? And if you do all of them, this person, once they're through the system, can become this person for the next. So it's a train the trainer model. Okay. Well, this is great, except once again, it really begins to lend itself to this adaptive process. If it works really well, then we don't need people in it. But we don't believe that. So the question becomes, well, what about having people that help us develop with what is this area and what does it look like? That as you go through it, we have experts saying, hey, I looked at this course, have you looked at that? You didn't know about this one. And they begin suggesting materials, rating materials, giving background materials. And we obviously have people in the process who can begin saying things like, I got this portfolio and clearly you're missing something in your assessment. And the student themselves can say, as I'm going through, here are some resources I found helpful that you don't have. And you begin building an ecosystem where as people are learning, they're documenting it. Now, this is Bob Boyko at the University of Washington. He's doing this at undergraduate data science. So he teaches data science, but rather than doing it in this big classroom, it's an online system where they can go in and they can begin to say, I took this assessment, this is where you need support, et cetera. They get peer reviews, peer evaluations, and now he convincingly feels he can teach 1,000 students in a data class. And it's, it's personalized. Because if you teach 100 people, if you teach 30 people in an online class, even in a physical class, you don't have the time to sit there and go, well, Meg is always slow on this topic. So I'm going to spend, right, sorry, right? But I'm going to spend time with her. But we don't even know the idea of being able to do, per we just don't have the time in how we're currently structured. The ability to bring this stuff on intelligently, not to replace us, but to supplement and support us, gets really exciting. So now, when I go back to Bill Hogue's original idea, I'm no longer saying I'm out of a job. I'm now saying this helps me do my job better. And that becomes really interesting to me. And so back to the idea that the library is about data and understanding data utilization. If they're about instruction in many cases, how can we do those kinds of things here? How can we model new behaviors and new systems for online education and continuing education and not simply assume that someone else's problem to deal with that? Okay. Other factors that are going to lead us to changing are things like free college initiatives. Right? This is something that we can't avoid. We need, as a university, and I would argue as a library, to take this on. Free college initiatives, right now the, the two sort of biggest ones are in New York and New Mexico, but many under consideration. They're not thinking about the research aspects of tuition-free education. They're thinking about the tuition aspect and teaching. And we've seen this decimate many a department by the idea of once you define the core activity of a university as teaching, then you begin to look at contingent labor and things of this nature, and you begin to decimate the research process and the tenure track process. If we don't begin to look at how we intelligently integrate research and human beings into that process, that's where we're headed. We're seeing outsourcing. When I left Syracuse University, their Masters of Library Science was, in essence, outsourced to 2U. So 2U is a startup company. They find the expert. They take them to an to a undisclosed location in Virginia videotape lectures for a 10-week like session, provide their own support for their own learning management system, which is synchronous, by the way. They offer 20 sections, because they only allow 17 students in each, but that's OK. You have graduate assistants. And for this, 60% of the tuition for that class goes to 2U, and the rest goes to the university. That's kind of scary to me. Um, Private players, Pearson, can we survive the fourth disruptive attempt? What I mean is, if you look at major disruptions coming in higher education, first major disruptive uh, event I'll talk about is private, the idea of for-profit private universities. That was going to do away with the universities as we know it. Now, it didn't, primarily because they decided to chose piracy over the idea of you know, and, and predatory lending practices. They wanted our funding. They didn't necessarily want our teaching. And so that didn't. But how many people either here or that you know are in private universities now that are taking these kinds of things? The second was this idea of um, the MOOC. Right? Remember MOOCs, Coursera, and edX was going to do it? Right? Luckily, they chose the least innovative teaching practice we had at a university, which is large lecture halls, and said, that is it. That's the future. And so everyone else sort of said, no. And so that didn't do it. So there's another missed hit. 
But then 2U represents another one. How do we outsource different components? And if you say you'll never outsource parts of our education, how much of this university's function has been outsourced? How many dormitories, for example, are not owned and run by the universities? Food service is no longer run by the university. I'm not saying, by the way, we're in the food business, but we're constantly seeing things that we used to define as the university get defined as not the university, and when does it hit us in terms of teaching, et cetera? Okay. I'm not sure we can survive the fourth one. I think we should be the fourth one. I think we're the ones who should look at this and say things like, you know what, that course, that continuing education we're doing, what if we actually gave academic credit for that as well? What if we said that if you go through this course, that's worth a third of your master's of library science education, therefore discounting it by a third? What if we began looking at life experience and bringing that in? How can we become the disruptive effort, the lean startup, if you will, of the university in doing that? So there's my macro trends, right? And really, if you want to look at them, it breaks down to the notion of data, media, and society. We're, interview we're looking to innovate and have opportunities in data, how we keep it, how we massage it, but also how the institution uses it and how we keep it clean. We're looking at innovations in media, open educational resources, self-publishing, the creation of these open access resources. And we're really looking in terms of society. What's its impact in terms of preparing people for society, preparing work as well? And so what my, I will just finish up with because I've got one minute left, um, is that idea that when I think about what is the future of the research library, the future of the research library for me fits into these three things, but it all sits around the idea of making a academic unit, make an academic institution function better, function more humanely, and take advantage of automation at the same time it builds in the expertise of individuals. And librarianship is well suited to do this, not only because we have great data skills and media skills, but because we've been doing that. Right? From copy cataloging way back in the day, to looking at online reference services, to looking at data production, we've been looking at what's that right mix between expertise and automation in librarianship. Not that we ever have it right, but it's something we're working on. And we have faculty that are unprepared to do that. And so these are the contributions that I believe that we can make in setting that future agenda. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions, arguments, throwing things at me. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. And um, uh, from that forum, uh, two things that uh, were consistently brought as a major threat to libraries was uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. which you pointed out to, and outsourcing. Mm -hmm. um, but you also pointed out to, but they uh, took uh, a special <coughs> polish to Wikipedia. Um, and <laughs> so, um, that kind of stuck with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I agree, disagree. Uh, I mean, it's, I think there are answers to lots of different things, but I'm just curious to know what your take on uh, those issues. Uh, so, another bre breakfast time discussion. We're talking about the fact that um, we feel like, when before I talk about AI, I feel like I've got to say, but I love technology and I believe technology can do great things and I'm not a Luddite. But AI scares the hell out of me, but not because it's going to put me out of a job, but because it is a fabulous way of encoding our personal biases and failures as a, as a race and pretending it's now objective because it's in a piece of code. That's what scares me about AI. Um, and that's why I think it's vital for librarians and libraries to be a part of that. Once again, not fighting against it, but adapting it to where it can be useful, right? The, there are. When I talked about those adaptive learning techniques, and we have conversations at the faculty around this, I sit there and go, how many times do you really want to teach APA citation style every year for every core class ever? Can't we simply say, there it is, right? Or HTML, there it is. And we can do that now with these sort of standalone classes. But what I'm looking for is how we can truly build in the intelligence so they can be adaptive, so people can get one-on-one -on -one feedback in much more intelligent ways. 
I get really excited then when I think, um, so, oof, this goes really way back. Um, I like IA instead of AI, which is intelligence amplification. That idea that when you really mix what computers do with what humans do in a really powerful way, I love that. So we need to be at that table. It's an important table. We also need to do a much better job of demystifying it because right now um, what most people say when they AI mean a bunch of things from big data to data analysis to deep learning algorithms, machine learning algorithms and such. And we need to be part of that. I mean, it's. We never used to question when librarians would spend a huge amount of time with information retrieval systems at a technical level, breaking them apart and evaluating them. Remember everything, does it do Boolean and does it do sets and queries? I know mean, I'm dating myself. But the point is, that same idea of looking at systems and breaking them down and understanding what the value systems, how do you evaluate it, that's where we should be. So I think AI is an area that we should be part of a conversation in not only because of our general values and making sure that they're in there, but also because I think we can benefit from where automation does. In terms of outsourcing, um, I have a real, real, real problem with outsourcing curriculum and instruction. I know that's not what we're talking about. In the library, my answer to that is, if you can be outsourced, then you're not doing your job well because your job is not maintaining and providing access to materials. Your job is to shape and improve the community that you're in. And so how much does this university look like another university and why, right? What is it the services, right? Back to that first article when I talking about maker spaces is sort of, well, it's great to try it, but really they just want books. We know that some libraries, academic libraries, have amazing maker spaces that they're using with because it fit that community well. And what we have to get out of as, um, as a profession is we've got to get out of the applying business and into the adapting business if I hear one more time, we've got to develop a toolkit, or we've got to develop, you know, right, here's the toolkit on how to do X, Y, or Z. The answer is, it's going to be different in your setting. What works for us with online instruction is going to be different for you. And the more you can become deeply enmeshed in the functioning of it, the harder you talk about outsourcing it. So is it a danger? Yeah, I, um, but I think that the answer to it is not get more books and get bigger. The answer to it is, understand the data to demonstrate your value and your worth and have that customized directly to the community that you're interacting with so that it's almost impossible to tell where you start and the community stops, right? It all fits in there. Is that okay, fair enough? You're welcome. Yes? Hi. Um, my name is Amy Trost and I'm a data services librarian at UMD. Um, and I was interested, um, the thing that captured me in your, your talk was you were talking about this um, adaptive learning and this kind of AI-driven instruction. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting here listening to it, and I was like, that's a joke. He's totally off. And then you flashed the slide of um, Bob Lindo mm -hmm. at, at UW, at the University of Washington. And um, I actually took a class with him in 2014. I took XML with him, and it was adaptive. And it was kind of, um, you know, there were different tracks of things you could do and, and um, you know, you kind of, the, the way you coded his his um, interface was responsive as you put in these snippets of code. And um, what was crazy was there were like 60 of us in that class and we didn't interact with them that much because so much of it was adaptive and online. But you know, like after the semester was over, um, I remember talking to him a few times and he knew so much about me and he knew me and he knew my final project. Um, because the way the class was structured, even with a huge number of people, he was able to kind of interact with us. So that was really interesting. And that was actually a case where I felt like this, you know, application of adaptive learning worked really well. But it, it's still like, there's a piece of me that's really scared by the whole thing because I feel like that, that might have been one of like 20% of the classes I took in library school that would respond well. Yeah. I don't oh. know. So, and, so and overall, I am still scared. I don't, I don't know. It's, well, it's really, like, well, welcome to my world. Right. Well, and, and so, for example, um, do you guys have a learning management? Are you a Blackboard place or are you a yeah. Canvas? Adaptive uh, mastery paths is is a very simple form of adaptive learning that you can build into Canvas. So what you can do is say, given the results of this grade, this test, or whatever, take them to this material, expose this material, etc. It's it's as low level from a programming standpoint, basically setting conditionals. If they do well on this, give them this kind of thing. Bob's taking that much further because he actually has, based on outcomes and the idea of self-evaluation and peer evaluations. Um, so you're right, it's crap in the sense that if we let other people do it that don't understand 
the necessity of that human connection within a class, that don't understand the complexity of topics. Part of the problem with 2U, for example, first of all, the university had to sign a 10-year contract. And what that 10-year contract says is once I create a class, every four years we'll update the class. I, once again, I teach library science, I teach the introduction, I, I have to teach the history of books every so often, even that class doesn't stay the same from one semester to another. And so that idea of adaptive isn't, what my worry is, back to AI, what my worry is is that someone will be like IBM Watson. It's there, it's obvious, we'll just take the data and I'm sure it will work. And the reason that never got implemented is because the nursing faculty went and said, oh no. Right? The same reaction I had, which is I'm out of a business, I don't want to do this. But when you turn it around and say, all right, what could we do well? And that's what, like I said, I really respect Bob's work because that's what he does is, and he hand, hard codes it. And so can we as a university help other people do that? I remember back when MOOCs and ed Aero, edX and all those Coursera were going to be huge, many universities basically said, we will help you put on a MOOC. Well, where are we with in terms of we will help you with doing some of these instructional systems to support the systems? And worry about the privacy, right? If I know that, for example, student X is really slow on this topic, does that become something that hinders that student as they move into the, right reputations and such following, privacy, information, et cetera? One of the things that scared me in terms of data usage was actually, what was it? Was it JSTOR that was now going to be using student search history as predictors of behavioral problems? And if they were searching for things on you know mental health issues and suicide and all that, they were going to then trigger um, intervention services. Right? That scares the hell out of me, using data inappropriately that way. So um, I guess my point is, it's coming. And if we aren't the ones that put it in place, I fear for what's going to actually be put in place, because I don't think it's going to have all of the value that human beings bring to that system. So, But I'm scared, too. <laughs> yes, please. Your first comment, I'm a big fan of Herb Simon um, and his satisficing concept. And it drives me nuts when I hear students will go to Google because they're lazy. It's like, no, students will go to Google because it's a minimal amount of effort that has in the past given them a maximum amount of reward. It's, 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 we make that determination. And so um, we need to give them a little credit. Um, the second thing about approaching faculty is faculty need to be approached, obviously, differently. But at a research university, and this is not a universal take, but many faculty are really interested in research and not so much in the teaching side. And so the notion of coming to them with solutions and potential ways of assisting them in doing a good job with minimizing the amount of effort they put out, I, I, I found pretty useful. And, but also coming to them with initially solutions. In other words, we have this, we can implement it. Because the reason Turnitin went crazy was not because we convinced faculty that, that plagiarism was something that needed to be tracked. It was the fact that it was a tool they could use easily. And the problem is that we also didn't train them. This is a problem we get with information literacy instruction when done poorly, which is we treat things like intellectual property not as discussion of merit and discussion of sharing innovations. We teach it as breaking rules in the law. And turn it in doesn't do any good to change that narrative. Um, but it's a solution that they came into it. Um, that idea of being there to say, how can I help and support this and take this load off of you, I think oftentimes it will be um, taken 
very well. Now, there are some faculty, I, I don't want to say all, but there's a good portion of faculty that they take great pride in their teaching, whether they should or not. Um, and so that idea of finding a partner and, and being helpful, but it still comes to a conversation where you've got to be an instrument. It's an instrumentality viewpoint. You need to have a solution to provide, not simply simply raising them and going, let's talk in general. And so some of these, whether it's the adaptive learning system, some of it is um, with discovery systems, these are things that by showing how it saves them time, you then begin to, to introduce them to the concept of, and it's better, and we can do more, and this could be another conversation. So I don't think I have a specific answer for you other than I found the saving them time to be a big part of it. The other thing is, is looking at when faculty are most vulnerable, and that's when they're coming up for tenure. And one of the questions I always have is, what tenure support system do you have at this university? What do you provide the library? Um, I had a colleague going up for tenure. I said, call the library, see what they'll do. And the answer was, you or your graduate assistant can come down and in about an hour we can show you how to do a citation search. And I thought, all right, the most important valuable thing in this person's life can be, is, is only worth an hour of time. And everything about librarianship can be encapsulated in one hour to a graduate assistant. As opposed to, you know who's going up for tenure, knocking on the door and saying, hi, I'm your tenure librarian. I'm going to be, I've already begun citations analysis, I've begun these searches, I've begun providing this data and putting your portfolio together. Let's talk about what else we can do. Now the best part of this is if they get tenure, you're the best human being ever and they'll come to you for everything. Mm -hmm. And if they don't get tenure, they leave and don't have time to badmouth you. So this is it's a, <laughs> a no-lose situation. But, but that's, the, my, my point is, it's the point of pain. And so tenure is a great point of pain because, or reappointment, because they really are open to things that will help them, um, right? And, and Google Scholar is saved so many people because it's so bad in how it defines what's a scholarly paper. But I love the number. I'll take the Google Scholar numbers over Web of Science any day. Um, so find those points of pain because what you won't do is let me go to a faculty meeting and talk about our educational services. They'll tune you out. Let me come to your retreat and we'll build it around this. They won't. That notion of when can I interact and connect with them. They have a new class they don't know what to do with. They have tenure and they're willing to listen to me. This is times that you need to be there to be the supportive person because then you can expand the conversation. You. Welcome. Yes. Yes. Example is not a group, um, individual examples of societies or you know libraries or what have you. Because I I, I love what you laid out, but I think the problem is um, sometimes we lack imagination. Uh, you know, and I think we because we traditionally look at things in a framework of this is always work. So, right. You know, right. We're sticking to this, and versus trying to step move beyond that. And right. So, it's always easier to be second into anything. Yeah. No. It, 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 it makes sense. Um, you know, I, I, some of the examples that, that point out, I mean, they won't shock you because they're doing things. I mean, 
University of Nevada, uh, Reno, actually has a really interesting connection into their engineering and how they support the engineering systems. So they have maker spaces that they work um, with the mathematics department, for example, to visualize different functions and such, which help students. They have collaboratories, meeting spaces in the library. I notice I walk by whiteboards. Things that aren't shocking, but it comes down to the relationship that the librarian builds with, with that. North Carolina State University always is, a, is an impressive group to me. Um, the story I heard from North Carolina State, which is probably apocryphal, but I hope not, which was, um, so I come from the other, I come from the progressive Carolina, as I put it. Um, <laughs> with, whenever I'm on a panel with, with Gary Marchanini, who's the dean of Chapel Hill, he's always like, well, in Carolina we're doing this. I said, yes, yes we are. And so, um, <laughs> but there's a shadow of Chapel Hill that sort of goes in the southeast. Uh, and one of his to, to um, North Carolina State University, which is engineering. And the, the director of the library, when she was hired, came in and said, you know, I can't, I can't make you the world's premier research university, but I can make you the world's premier research library. And when you look at what she did about that, a lot of it was moving towards direct interaction and focus with the different departments. One of the things that was fabulous, they started a fellowship program. So they would go to library schools and recruit the best graduates to come and do two-year rotating fellowships at the university, and they would have them literally go to the different departments and then pick one and hire them. And so you're welcome to come grab our people. But um, I think that that's, you know, I see different factors like that. I love the self-publishing um, world that actually ARL, is it ARL? Or maybe it was ACRL put out a sort of self-publishing guide of materials where they're talking about different people and how they produce and be publishers. i really fascinated by MIT. Uh, I'm, one, Chris Borges is just an amazing human being. Um, but she, her concepts of open access, publishing, and such have gone, permeated not only the library, but now the university press is part of the library so that they want to put things out in open access and materials. And what many people don't realize at MIT, because they go, oh, MIT, is that the MIT library is tiny because vast majority of the money and research support is done through grants and external groups in labs and such. And so for a long time, that was an itty bitty library that wasn't moving very fast. And now they really have been pushing to be integrated in throughout the entire area. They've started their was it Knowledge Institute, I believe, that where they're really doing envisioning uh, with the whole faculty involved, not just within the university. So those are just some examples off the top of my head that, that I would pull up. But then the other question I have is, is there a reason that it can't be the University of Maryland that is doing these kinds of things, um, that's pushing forward? Like I say, all of those lovely pictures are your site. I mean, you, you have data services. You are pushing on all these areas already my fear is, and I do not want to talk because I don't work here, my fear is that they are happening in silos. And the, my, that fear comes because when I see other libraries, they tend to have it, like library instruction. These days, when we are preparing academic libraries, they say, how do I get a job? I say, be an instructional librarian. If you want to get an academic library job, you have to have instruction in here somewhere, because that's the hot area. But I've seen way too many that then they hire the instructional librarians and they're over in the corner and they're not sitting there talking about how do we shape the data services? How do we teach people how to do these different things? And so that's back to this community view of coordinating these different elements. And um, you have a new dean. I've met, you have fabulous staff here. I think the idea of making sure that these are seen as an initiative pushing the whole university forward is gonna be important. Because when you're talking with the African American Studies Department, they're gonna have data problems. And I don't mean, once again, the data they're storing they're going to have enrollment issues and how is that enrollment seen and what's the budget per capita. They're going to run into all of those things and as a librarian with a data background, and you say, but I don't have to, as a librarian you have a data background. You've been taught the idea of information organization. You have access to people who do that. That's a new service that you can bring into them which has helped them set up a strategic plan for their growth as well. So I don't know if that was helpful. Yeah. All right. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. Here at College Park, but we serve 17 campuses. And in 
thinking about using library data uh, that we collect to drive practices, um, we frequently think about like what are the possible benefits and what are some of the potential risks or, or challenges of trying to, you know, make sense out of such a large data set. And what do you think might be potential futures for library consortia in terms of operationalizing the data that they collect to help improve campus specific or even departmentally specific needs for um, more targeted services and responsive? Yep. Um, yeah. I, I think that the, the notion of building the dashboard right, <laughs> is not a bad service to offer because it's not a one size fits all. So working with local, the, the local campus on what do they need and what do they want to see the data, even though it may be coming from the data warehouse and the master pool of data, um, is going to be an important service to offer, which is how do we visualize this and work for your area. I think that, that that's a central service that can, be, that, that can be provided. You're gathering the data, you're looking at the data, how can we then secure it and visualize it, work with you locally. I see this, the actually prime example I've seen this is not in data, but in repository work, primarily article repository work, which is creating unified interfaces which get much more interesting the more institutions provide it, right? The, the classic problem with an institutional repository is it reflects your university, what, well, let me be honest. It reflects what your university's willing to spend the time and effort to put into a repository, right? Which is gonna vary. Um, but it's, it's, it's a sort of monoculture, it, it only, right? And so the idea of being able to bring in more players, particularly diverse players, whether it's the different campuses, et cetera, you can then create different views of it, you can create some dynamism. It's like the idea that an academic journal is useful, but it's only useful in that you have more than one author. Right? You have to have multiple authors looking at it and providing that, that interface and what they see at it. And so I think the same is true of data, which is working where you're building expertise on how do I manipulate the data, clean the data, visualize the data, utilize the data, analyze the data. But I, as a service, I'm working with those local institutions to see what stories do they need to tell. And then we can customize the interfaces to that data. And, and the word story is not accidental. I mean, even in data, it's data storytelling. It really is that idea of identifying the narrative that the administration, the faculty, the students, and the staff are supporting or building, and then how can we inform it? You always have to have a local person to make that connection, but you can provide it as a centralized service in terms of how you set it up and the skills to provide it. I, I don't know if I just talked around a big circle or not, but. Oh, very good. I've kept you long, longer than I should have, I, I fear. No, so. not at all. <laughs> Would you uh, join me again in thanking David? Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for coming out. Keep an eye out for our announcement for the uh, spring lecture and probably a new name for the series. So thank you. <laughs>